So welcome. Today we're going to be going over unit 11, testing and individual, individual differences, module number 62, the dynamics of intelligence. And if this is the first video you've watched um, on this channel, these modules are following along with Myers Psychology for the AP course, third edition. Okay. This is um, not a very long. Um, I'm this is not a long uh, module, uh, so it shouldn't take too long to get through. There are five learning targets. So at the end of reading the module and listening to these lecture slides that go along with it, you should understand these five things for sure. Uh, the first one: analyze how aging affects crystallized and fluid intelligence. The second one, define cross-sectional versus longitudinal studies and explain why it's important to know which method to, was used within a certain study. Describe the stability of intelligence test scores over the lifespan and discuss those traits of those at the low end of intelligence test scores and at the high end of intelligence test scores. So what has been the long held belief regarding aging and intelligence? We mentioned in a previous module, the Wexler intelligence test scores, and for a long time, based on the results of cross-sectional studies, which we'll mention in a, in a few slides, um, it was believed that the decline of mental ability with age is just part of the general aging process of the organism as a whole. Just so it was thought for a really long time, as you get older, it was just the way it is that you're gonna, your intelligence test scores, your levels of intelligence will just decline. And so for a really long time, this dismal view of aging was unchallenged. We, we just kind of thought that was the way it was. So what do we know about aging and intelligence today? So using longitudinal studies um, has changed things a little bit. So when you retest the same cohort of people, the same group of people over a period of years, they found that until late quite late in life, intelligence remained stable. On some tests, tests, scores even increased due partly to experiences with the tests. So when we think about this issue of intelligence test scores, levels of intelligence over time, it's important to kind of conceptualize intelligence in the dichotomy that we're thinking about in terms of most intelligence tests are divided generally, now they're very different, um, ways of measuring intelligence, but most of the very popular intelligence tests divide the ideas of crystallized and fluid intelligence into different components. Crystallized intelligence being our accumulated knowledge and verbal skills. This, this area of intelligence tends to increase with age. As we get older, we get more knowledge. Our general fund of information and ability to relate that information um, increases. For instance, the ability to recount the battles of World War II requires crystallized intelligence. Now, fluid intelligence is our ability to re reason speedily, quickly, and abstractly. And this tends to decrease with age, especially during later adulthood. So for instance, the ability to solve a logic puzzle requires fluid intelligence. Understanding the differences between crystallized and fluid intelligence is an important thing to understand for this course, if you're taking the AP exam for sure. So cross-sectional research. research using, researchers using the cross-sectional method study different groups at one time. Um, they found that mental ability IQ scores decline with age. So cross-sectional studies are looking at different people at different ages at the same point in time. Important point to remember. So cross-sectional research on aging. Um, look at this visual over here to the right. In this test of one type of verbal intelligence, inductive reasoning, the cross-sectional method showed declining scores with age. Now longitudinal studies, on the other hand, um, within those researchers are using, are, are restudying the same group of people at different times in their lifespan. So you can understand that these types of studies take a really long time, right? If you're going to test someone at the age of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and, um, and so on maybe, 
those are those are going to be really hard studies, right? So many things happen and people drop out and everything, but they can provide unbelievably rich information. Um, so longitudinal studies follow and retest the same people over time. And it's important to understand the differences between cross-sectional and longitudinal studies. And when you're reading about studies to be able to identify which type is being used. So longitudinal research on aging, the longitudinal method in which the same people were retested over a period of years, remember, showed a slight rise in scores well into adulthood. So you can see this visual is a little bit different than the one a few slides ago. So what are con some considerations when considering a cross-sectional -sec study? Well, comparing 70-year-olds and 30-year-olds means comparing different populations and comparing different people, not just that, but also comparing different errors, eras. <laughs> These researchers were comparing generally less educated people who were born in the 1950s, 1900s, and bet with better educated people born after 1950. They were comparing people raised in large families with people raised in smaller families, people raised from people from less affluent families with people from more affluent families. So there were many variables that were present in a lot of the early cross-sectional studies on um, what happened with intelligence test scores across time. And these variables did have an effect on what, what the researchers found. So that's really important to understand that there were, when you're comparing different groups of people, it's not the same as comparing the same group of people over time. So what are some considerations when comparing the same people through time within longitudinal studies? They have their own issues. Participants who survive the end are gonna maybe be different than those that you know, died off earlier or dropped out of the study. Participants who survive for the end may be the healthiest and brightest people. When researchers adjust for loss of participants, they find an intelligence decline, especially after age 85. Many variables could impact the presence of some members of the sa sample population at various points in the research. So aging adults in terms of intelligence, um, IQ scores specifically, both win and lose. What does that mean? Well, we need to really think about those concepts of fluid versus crystallized intelligence. Aging adults lose recall memory and processing speed. So usually there are declines in fluid intelligence, but they gain in vocabulary and knowledge, which just makes sense with more experience, hopefully more reading, more exposure to many different things, your vocabulary and your knowledge base will grow. So in terms of aging adults, the fluid intelligence may decline, um, but crystallized intelligence is more likely to increase. So while fluid intelligence may decline, some other research found that older adult social reasoning skills increase, as shown by an ability to take multiple perspectives, to appreciate knowledge limits, and to offer helpful wisdom in times of social conflict. So this particular study, when I read about it, always makes me think about how important it is to have um, diversity of ages within groups, uh, because there are different, uh, you know, different uh, areas where different age groups are going to ha likely have uh, more well-developed skills. So decisions become less distorted by negative emotions, such as anger, depression, and anxiety as people get older as well, which is import an important thing. Okay, so an AP exam tip. Students often tend to confuse crystallized and fluid intelligence when they're first learning about these skills. Being able to identify examples of each, so when you think about different, um, you know, when you're thinking about doing a reasoning activity very quickly, um, you're going to be thinking more about fluid intelligence, you're thinking about, you know, a large general fund of information, you're going to be thinking about crystallized intelligence. And this particular example here, it might help you to think about how crystals grow larger over time, as does our intelligence, might be a little um, mnemonic to help you. So how stable are intelligence test scores over the lifetime? For most children, casual observation and intelligence tests before the age of three aren't very predictive, okay? So those of us that, you know, have a six-month-old and we can think we can tell how intelligent, intelligent they are based on a test score, um, that's probably not going to happen. By age four, however, which is still quite young, children's performance on intelligence tests begins to predict their adolescent and adult scores. By age 11, the stability becomes impressive. 
um, as Ian Deary and his colleagues discovered. So by age 11, your, your IQ scores are gonna be pretty stable across time. So consider this longitudinal study. Remember, longitudinal studies are studying the same group of people across time. Researcher Ian Deary and his colleague, colleagues utilized longitudinal studies of intelligence in Scotland. On June 1st, 1932, essentially every child in the country born in 1921 that's a lot, that was a lot of children, 87,498 children around age 11 took an IQ test. The aim was to identify working class children who would benefit from further education. So the results were impressive. When the intelligence test administered to 11 year old Scots in 1932 was readministered to 542 survivors as turn of the millennial 80 year, old, 80 year olds, the correlation between the two sets of scores was striking after nearly 70 years of very varied life experiences. So if you remember with correlation, you see that trend line is pretty strong there. You know, as one, um, you know, as one variable is going up, the other one is going up as well. And you can see that there is a strong positive correlation between the IQ scores at the different ages 11 versus ages 80, which is really fascinating to think about. So does intelligence correlate with longevity, how long people live? Another finding of Deary's study was that women scoring in the highest 25% on the Scottish National Intelligence Test at age 11 tended to live longer than those who scored in the lowest 25%. Now switching gears a little bit, thinking about the extremes of IQ scores, what is intellectual disability? It's a condition of limited intellectual or mental ability indicated by, most often, an IQ score below 70, you can see which is circled right there, um, and also uh, comorbid, comorbidly having difficulties with the adaptive functioning of everyday life. So it's not just an IQ score, it's also having difficulty with the demands of every, everyday life. An intellectual disability is the same term as mental retardation. It's just a newer term that we utilize um, instead of utilizing the term mental retardation. So the two criteria that must be met for diagnosis of an intellectual disability, as I said, low score on an IQ test score, usually about 70, usually a score of 70, below 70 is considered that low enough intellectual functioning for an intellectual disability, and also difficulty adapting and functioning independently. So this is measured by different, different types of rating scales and interviewing techniques. Um, I often one would be evaluating for individuals with intellectual disabilities when I was a school psychologist and I would administer intelligence tests and I would also interview parents, teachers, the student as well to try to figure out where that student's adaptive functioning, their ability to function independently fell compared to same age peers. And this adaptive functioning is usually measured within conceptual, social, and practical domains. So Down syndrome is a condition of mild to severe intellectual disability and it's associated physical disorders and it's caused um, by an extra copy of chromosome 21. And it may be um, a situation uh, that you have noticed in the in around you, you may have you may know someone, or may have a family member uh, who has Down syndrome. And one of the things with Down syndrome is that it doesn't oftentimes individuals with Down syndrome have intelligence test scores that fall below that intellectual disability range, but it's not always the case. So that's important to remember. Um, this is an example of mainstreaming in Chile. Most Chilean children with Down syndrome have attended separate schools for children with spe special needs. How this is, however, this is a boy um, that has been mainstreamed um, at the Altamira School where children with differing abilities share the classrooms. And it's a super cute picture showing how happy this boy is um, working in this mainstream classroom. So at the other end of the IQ distribution, is giftedness. Students, children, or youth who give evidence of high achievement capability in areas such as intellectual, creative, artistic, or leadership capacity, or even in specific academic fields, and who need services and activities not ordinarily um, provided by the school to fully develop those capacities. Those individuals are considered gifted. 
This would be an example of a gifted child uh, who completed his third college degree by the time he was 14. Wow. Um, when this math major graduated from UCLA, he was um, amazing, right? He, like, this is very rare to, to have this level of giftedness, but there are people like that. Um, every year I see a few people here and there, you know, information about them on different social media that they graduated from college at like age 12 or they're getting their law degree and they're only 13. Those th sort of things are um, very rare, but they do happen. According to this boy's mother, he first picked up a college textbook and started reading it at age two. Of course, that's very, very abnormal, but it does happen. So in terms of giftedness, what does the research show about the success of gifted children? Um, other studies who have followed the lives of precocious youth had, who had aced the math SAT at age 13 by scoring in the top 1% of their age group. By their 50s, these 1,650 math quizzes had secured 681 patents. So that's a testament to um, the fact that, you know, those earlier measures at age 13 can be really predictive of later uh, sort of academic successes. About 1% of Americans earn doctorates, but for the 12 and 13 year olds who score in the top 1%, one in 10,000 among those of their age taking the SAT, about 4% had done so. So it's a little bit higher there. So what are some criticisms of gifted programs in public schools? So, um, and, and this, is, this is very different. I've worked in many school districts across different states and lived in different states and gifted programs can be very different. Um, so this, these are just some generalizations, but gifted child programs tend to segregate, segregate high scoring children in special classes, giving them academic enrichment not available to their peers. Critics know that separating learners by aptitude some sort of times creates that self-fulfilling prophecy, implicitly labeling other kids as ungifted and maybe denying them opportunities. So there, while gifted programs can be very good, there are some concerns about the labeling and what that means for those that are not labeled gifted. So we are already to our learning target reviews. So analyze how aging affects crystallized and fluid intelligence. Remember those two important concepts. Cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies have shown that fluid intelligence declines in older adults, in part because neural processing probably slows, and crystallized intelligence tends to increase that general fund of information. Cross-sectional studies versus longitudinal studies. Understanding what those are is important. Cross-sectional studies compare people of different ages at the same point in time. Longitudinal studies follow and retest the same cohort over a period of years. So cross-sectional studies also compare people of different eras and life circumstances. So those variables can have a, bit, a strong effect on the results of studies. This can provide, they can provide really good snapshots of a particular time, but longitudinal st studies are better equipped to trace the evolution of traits over a longer period of time. So how about the stability? You know, how IQ test scores remain over a lifespan. The stability of IQ test scores increases with age. What that means is, so by about age four, scores fluctuate somewhere, somewhat, but they begin to be predictive of adolescent and adult scores. By early adolescence, and as is mentioned in these slides, by about age 11, scores become very stable and predictive to adult IQ test scores. Discuss the traits of those at low and high IQ extremes. An intelligence test score of or below about 70 is one diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability, with the other being uh, limited conceptual, social, and practical skills. Those adaptive functioning skills must also be um, on the lower end. Down syndrome was one disorder that we noted. A developmental disorder caused by an extra copy of chromosome 21 is one known physical cause of intellectual disability. So the traits of those at the low and high intelligence extremes, people with high IQ scores tend to be healthy and well-adjusted as well as unusually successful academically. Schools sometimes track such children and, and separate them from those with lower scores, but there's concern about that that can be problematic and create the self-fulfilling prophecies of both groups. So sort of to live up to or down to others' perceptions and expectations. And that is it for today. Thank you for listening. Take care.